Good morning, Hank. It's Friday, July 11th, and tomorrow in Belfast, Northern Ireland, there's going to be a riot. And explaining why there's going to be a riot involves like a thousand years of Irish history, and that's a lot for one YouTube video. But, Hank, you know how much I love teaching history, so I'm gonna do it anyway. Here ended the Vlogbrothers party. Quick side note. If you're actually from Northern Ireland, then this video isn't really for you, because you should know everything that I'm going to be talking about. So I made a little thing on my side channel which you should particularly enjoy, and you can watch it if you just click right here. Okay? Okay. Oh, and uh, I have a side channel now. Uh, side channels are cool. <laughs> okay, let's start at the start. St. Patrick, who you may know as the patron saint of American college students getting drunk on beer with food colouring in it, spread Christianity to Ireland in the 5th century. He wasn't Irish and he didn't have anything to do with snakes, but he did a pretty good job of making everyone Christian, which in these medieval times meant Catholic. Which was fine, Ireland went on with its Celtic lords and kings, occasionally getting raided by Vikings and generally minding its own business. That is, until 1154, when an Englishman, Adrian IV, was elected Pope. And he decided that Ireland wasn't being obedient and Catholic enough, so he decided to send his good friends the English monarchy to invade and sort everything out. They succeeded in invading and subjugating Ireland, and the English king was eventually granted the title Lord of Ireland, although in practice, English control only extended as far as a small area outside Dublin known as the Pale. The rest of it was ruled by the Celtic lords who had previously ruled Ireland. Which was fine, the king spent his time in London and he appointed some of his fellow Catholic lords to take care of business in Ireland. Until, in 1542, Henry VIII decided the English monarchy shouldn't really be Catholic anymore. Which as you can imagine caused a little bit of dynastic turmoil and burning of monasteries and everything, but it was much more problematic in Ireland, where the old Catholic nobles and the old Catholic Gaelic lords had been used to running the whole place for 400 years. So what followed was over 60 years of war, where the Tudor monarchs, including Henry VIII and later Elizabeth I, fought to bring Ireland more tightly under English control. The last of these was the Nine Years' War between the Tudor monarchy under Elizabeth I and the powerful O'Neill clan of Ulster, which involved scorched earth tactics and some pretty brutal fighting. But in the end, the Tudor monarchy was victorious and was in a position to severely crack down on the power of the old Gaelic lords. They did this to such an extent that by 1607, O'Neill, his ally Tyrconnell, and the rest of the old Gaelic nobility fled the country, forfeiting their lands to the crown. This meant that the new monarch, James I, inherited large swathes of land in Ulster, with which he could do what he wanted. And he did what any Protestant monarch would do. He tried to fill the land with Protestants to make Ireland easier to govern. This ambitious plan, known as the Plantation of Ulster, involved the counties of Cavan, Donegal, Armagh, Fermanagh, Tyrone, and a new county created out of parts of the others as well as the old county Coleraine. It was given to the London Guilds of Tradesmen to plant for themselves, and was named after them. County London Derry. As well as planting the county, the guilds had to build two new fortified cities, Coleraine and London Derry. More about those later. More importantly, however, the plan didn't really work as it was supposed to. They didn't attract as many Protestants as they would have liked, and they underestimated the amount of land they actually had, which meant that instead of kicking all the Catholics out, the Catholics needed to be retained to help work all of the land. They also didn't attract the type of people they were expecting. Instead of worthy English gentlemen, they mostly attracted Scottish sharecroppers, some of whom were on the run from the law. However, it did work in the sense that now most of the land in Ulster was in Protestant hands and there were sizeable Protestant communities in all of the counties involved. And those Protestant communities had their own culture and language and especially religion to the indigenous Catholic population so that they didn't mix and they developed their own identity. Now there was a major Catholic rebellion in 1641 but I'm going to skip it because it happened at the same time as the English Civil War so it's really really freaking complicated. All you need to know is that despite the fact that most of the land in Ireland was in Protestant hands and there had been sizable plantations of Protestants in Ulster, the vast majority of the population in Ireland was still Catholic. But as long as there was a Protestant English king in charge of the nobility, the whole system worked fine, which it did until 1685, when James II took the throne and he was a Catholic. Which, considering that the King of England is supposed to be the spiritual head of the Protestant Church of England, is a pretty big problem. And as it turned out, his reign went so badly that he was kicked off the throne by Christmas 1688. Except, after he fled to France, the King of France, who very much wanted a fellow Catholic on the throne of England, told him to go and get his throne back. And the most sensible way of getting his throne back was to start in Ireland, where most of the population were Catholics and were likely to support him. He therefore landed in 1689 with a sizable French military force and began marching north with the aim of hopping across to Scotland and then marching south towards London. However, that plan had one big problem. The Protestant walled fortified city of Londonderry that had been built less than 80 years before. The Protestant defenders of Londonderry had actually closed the gates to royal soldiers before James II had been kicked off the throne, so they were more than willing to defend their city when he attempted to lay siege to them. 
The siege dragged on for three months at the start of 1689, but a combination of Irish summer weather, a lack of artillery and tactical disputes meant that eventually the siege was broken and James had to retreat. The next year, the new English king, King William IV, or William of Orange, or King Billy, landed at Belfast with a large English, Dutch and Danish force and quickly marched south. He met James's armies at the Boyne, which was the last river north of Dublin, and defeated them on the 1st of July 1690. He then took Dublin and defeated James's armies again the next year on the 12th of July 1691, massacring them at the Battle of Ockram. Now remember all those dates, they're going to be pretty damn important. So the status quo is maintained. Protestant king, Protestant ability, Protestant landowners, Protestants in Ulster. Mostly Catholic population. Okay, so we're going to skip over the 18th century because nothing that important happens and get to the 19th century where important stuff starts to change. Why did things change? Well, nationalism. Italy was becoming a country, Germany was becoming a country, all the countries in the Austro-Hungarian Empire were becoming a country, so why wasn't Ireland becoming a country? Now Ireland missed out on the first revolutionary wave in Europe of 1848 because we were kind of busy having a potato famine at the time. But towards the end of the century, Irish political nationalism began to develop, and it developed to the extent that a series of sympathetic liberal prime ministers began to introduce home rule bills to the House of Commons, which would have given Ireland its own parliament in Dublin. The third of these was eventually passed, after a minor constitutional crisis, in 1912, just as a fine piece of Irish engineering was going down in the mid-Atlantic with Leonardo DiCaprio hanging off the back of it. But the problem was, those Protestants in Ulster who were descended from the plantation hadn't gone away. They didn't feel Irish, they had their own heritage and culture and tradition. And the capital of Ulster, Belfast, was an industrial hub that benefited from trade, like Liverpool or Glasgow. They therefore identified much more strongly with Britain than Ireland, and therefore formed organisations and political parties with the aim of keeping Ulster British. They even ran guns from the Germans to try and keep Ulster British. The onset of World War I kind of averted civil war, but the tensions hadn't really gone away, especially considering large amounts of Ulstermen fought and died for Britain, especially at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. So when they revisited this issue after the war, the only option was to split Ireland in half, with the parts that wanted to remain part of Britain remaining part of Britain, and the parts that wanted to leave, leaving. The Ulster Unionists wanted the historic nine counties of Ulster to remain part of the UK, the Irish Nationalists only wanted the four that were Protestant dominated, and eventually they hit on a compromise of six, Fermanagh, Antrim, Tyrone, Londonderry, Armagh and Down. This was to become Northern Ireland. But that didn't solve the problem either. Northern Ireland, when it was established with its own legislature and government, was run as a Protestant state for a Protestant people. Even though there was a sizable Catholic minority, they had basically no political or social rights. This led to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, which did achieve some of its aims, but some of its rallies descended into civil disobedience and partial violence. The use of a Protestant police force on the Protestant British Army to stop the civil disobedience only increased the cycle of violence and led to what is euphemistically known as the Troubles, a 30-year terrorist insurgency against the British government. This long period of terrible atrocities being committed on both sides is probably what Northern Ireland is best known for in the world today, but it was eventually brought to an end by the Good Friday Agreement in 1990. However, that agreement left a lot of things vague. For instance, Northern Ireland does not have an official national flag, nor does it have an official national anthem, because politicians can't agree on one. And more importantly, the peace process, as it's known, has done a bad job of engaging with the Protestant working class, which has led to civil disobedience concentrated around the marching season, a series of parades which commemorate those victories won by William of Orange for Protestantism 300 years ago. The recurring claim of these people, when asked why they are so angry, is that they feel that their culture is under threat, which is something that can be quite hard to understand. But the thing is, the Siege of Londonderry, part of that war between two kings I was just telling you about, is still going on. It's just in our heads. A lot of Protestants imagine their community as a walled city and that the Catholics are at the gates coming to get them. And their actions are similar to those in the siege. You've got the idealists looking out to sea for help from Britain. You've got the evangelicals who are praying in the church for assistance. You've got the political leaders doing dodgy deals in back rooms that they don't want anyone to know about. And then you've got the idiots who are just standing on the ramparts shouting no surrender into the wind. Meanwhile, the Catholics outside are having serious arguments about tactics and wondering really if they'll live long enough to ever achieve their goal. If I'm going to stretch this metaphor even further, the siege was terrible for everyone. I mean, if you were inside Londonderry at the end of the siege, you were living in a bombed out wreck of a city, surrounded by corpses of people who've died for disease, trying to hunt down rats and dogs to eat because there is no food. 
Meanwhile, if you're outside the walls in the besieging army, you're sitting in a damp hole in a backwater in Ireland with a French soldier who you can't even talk to, and your comrades are dying of disease, and you're receiving confusing and contradictory orders. The siege mentality hurts everyone, and the only way to get around it is to find ways to break the Protestant-Catholic dichotomy. But considering the previous thousand years of history, that's a pretty damn hard thing to do. So that's why there's going to be a riot tomorrow. And just because you only hear about it on the 12th of July, doesn't mean it's just tomorrow's problem. DFTBA.